Hello everyone and welcome back to my Sandbox EDB series in KSP 1.0.2. The EDB has lately been hesitant to use the LVN, the Nerve Engine, because of the lack of appropriate lightweight liquid fuel tanks to feed it. However, the Bureau has received numerous comments about its potential use as a space tug, so we are happy to announce the launch of the Nerfed Space Tug, Nerf being the adjective associated with the Nerve. Uh, the word nerve could be taken to imply something about the nervous system, and Kerbal's had trouble saying nerved anyway. So here is the launch of the nerfed space tug on top of the Taurus B. On its own, the nerfed space tug has a delta V of over 7,000 meters per second. And in order to attach to potential payloads, it uses a regular docking port, a regular Clampatron docking port. And um, we seem to have some some trajectory issues here with the Taurus B. SAS has been disengaged in order to regain control over the rocket. It seems SAS was overcorrecting and causing a wobble. And it's partly a problem with the payload actually. It's because the nerve engine has a 1.25 meter diameter, but its fuel load has to be quite voluminous and massive. Uh, if mounted as the EDB has done here with the nerve at the bottom and the fuel load on top, uh, that will tend to cause the payload to wobble because of the way it's attached. Of course, the EDB applied much struts to this situation, but clearly it was not enough. Now, the payload could be mounted upside down with the docking port facing down and the nerve tail facing up, the nozzle facing up, but uh, they did not do that this time. We did not do that this time. And here you see... Uh, as the engines switch from the mainsail to the now efficient Rhino and payload fairing separation there, there you see the situation and why the rocket is wobbling so much. Definitely a bad choice on how the payload was mounted, but, but uh, the EDB struggled on with this, uh, much shouting in mission control. Uh, Gene, Gene Kerman has not had an easy time the past few launches and that this was no exception. But the EDB did have it under control and so the Taurus B proceeded with its payload to orbit. Now this is not the only new vehicle that the EDB is planning to test today. Uh, we also have the refueler for the space tug, the method for bringing liquid fuel to it and so the EDB had to devise some sort of cheap and reusable method to deliver large amounts of liquid fuel into orbit and so we'll uh, show that off later on. Here the Taurus B has almost gone into orbit but it will need to coast to Apoapsis to complete that orbit. However, on its way up uh, it experienced some tumbling and that caused additional drag that uh, required more thrust in order to boost the uh, Apoapsis back up to 100 kilometers. But eventually the EDB got the vehicle under some sort of control but still uh, struggling to get it to that prograde vector as you can see there. But finally the Taurus B managed to get its payload into orbit. Uh, not not a excellent orbit but sufficient and here it finally got to dispense with the payload its burden for this mission. Payload extending solar panels here and finally Finally, payload release there, and the payload's RCS thrusters being used to move it away from the Taurus B. So, next order of business after the payload gets its docking port open and is now ready for service, uh, it is completely ready for service, lights on, but the next order of business is to land the Taurus B. Recent attempts by the EDB to recover its launch systems have met with haphazard results. Uh, even if the EDB uh, starts it out at a higher altitude, finds that uh, undershoots and then goes to an even higher altitude, sometimes it undershoots even more. And so there seems to be an overabundance of variables at work here uh, that determine how the, how the launch system is going to land. And so the EDB continues to struggle with that. Uh, this time, uh, it seemed to be on course, uh, though perhaps a little bit high, approaching the west coast of the home continent. And you can see uh, previously the EDB ordered the Taurus B to 
extend its brakes and it will do so again. To avoid the brakes burning up, the brakes have to be retracted at around 30 kilometers. At least that's what the EDB has noticed in previous testing, but uh, perhaps it would have been better to risk it here because the Taurus B is clearly going to overshoot. Not too far though. Uh, certainly a very close approach to the KSC, but with, with the water there and the Taurus B not entirely water safe. Um, this was not the ideal situation for recovering this launcher. And so here we go, we see that the Taurus B is definitely landing in the water about 30 kilometers away from the KSC. Initial parachute deployment was confirmed, and then uh, secondary parachute deployment also confirmed. In the final phase before touchdown, the engines were run to soften the landing. Gear was extended quite late in the process. And we'll see that here in a moment. There we are. And RCS? I'm not entirely sure whether the RCS was engaged at this point. Ah, there we go. RCS engaged so that the Werner thrusters can do their thing. And on splashdown, it was intact. Unfortunately, there was tipping. And of course, with a large launcher like this, any tipping is inevitably going to result in the complete loss of the vehicle. And that's what happened here. A uh, great tragic loss for the EDB, but the program moved on. And so here we see the space tug in orbit around Kerbin, completely oblivious to the complete loss of its stalwart friend, the Taurus B launcher, uh, which uh, carried it up braving many oscillations and wobbles. And there you see the look of the thing and how it is constructed. We will look forward to seeing this in action, boosting payloads to the moon, Minmus, and beyond. Next up, here we have the refueling method that I talked about. This is the Cutlass drone refueler. And at its center, it has four liquid fuel tanks. You see there, each with 800 units of liquid fuel for a total of 3,200 that it plans to bring to orbit. It has mop propellant and a docking port there, and it also has uh, tanks to complete its orbit that are cu currently locked there. Uh, that, those will be for burning at apoapsis, but uh, they maintain the balance. In any case, uh, five rapier engines at its tail for the Cutlass, and here we go. The wings are fueled, by the way. So liquid fuel in both the wings and the, there we go, the delta wings and the wing strakes. So here we go with the Cutlass taking flight. Needs to lift off at around 100 meters per second, or rotate at 100 meters per second, sorry. So very high lift off speed for the Cutlass. It immediately turns up to a, a bangle of between 35 and 40 degrees. And there you see it go. Considering that the Nerf Space Tug is a drone controlled craft, the EDB decided that it'd be logical to use another drone controlled craft to refuel it, uh, though this met with some opposition by pilots who wanted, of course, to take this space plane up. Making his observation on design from Hoffman Station, Jebediah Kerman noted that it was a brilliant looking plane with only one problem with it that it didn't have a cockpit. Here you have the start of the fuel cell, of course no solar panels on this particular craft, and at around 15 kilometers it leveled off and uh, prepared to break the sound barrier here, and so that's what you see it doing here. It'll lose some altitude, it goes down to about 13,500 meters before then continuing on upward, reaching a speed of Mach 1.3 before continuing up. It continued in jet mode to above 25 kilometers before switching to rocket mode to closed cycle mode using both liquid fuel and oxidizer and you'll see that there you go. All five rapier engines now in rocket mode. 
You might notice that this design required some part clipping, however this was legal part clipping. The EDB defines legal part clipping as part clipping that does not involve the Alt F12 method and also part clipping that does not involve Z fighting, which is any sort of conflict in the texture of the craft. And so in this case there was no Z fighting and uh, no use of any cheating and therefore this was legal part clipping and you can see that there is no conflict between those two uh, body sections, the two fuselage sections that are somewhat overlapping. And there it is time to unlock that reserve tank in the forward section and so that will be done. There's also a small liquid fuel tank in the nose of the craft and so that is also reserved. Uh, won't be necessary for this mission but the fuel margins are quite tight and as you can see uh, just barely getting to orbit. In any situation the Cutlass would not be the one to do the rendezvous. The, the nerfed space tug would have to make the rendezvous with the Cutlass and not the other way around. And uh, here now the EDB begins the, the recovery test bringing the Cutlass back home. Now this is a little bit of a iffy test because the Cutlass is still fully fueled with its cargo. And so this is not the exact same configuration that would really land after a mission. While you might think that the recovery would be easier without the extra load on the plane, uh, in fact it might be the case that the plane is simply more difficult to stop if it is so much lighter than it is right now. And so whether this is a really accurate test of how the plane would return is uncertain. But here we see its trajectory after it, uh, it starts out over the Western Ocean. There aren't any air brakes on the craft, nor any uh, drag chutes of any kind, and that might be something that the EDB will have to reconsider uh, in retrospect. But uh, here the craft comes out over the west side of the continent and over the mountains there, and clearly it is shooting high here definitely too high to make a direct approach to the space center and so at a certain point the EDB decides to have it go around and so it shuts down the outer two engines first of all because they're not going to be necessary at all and second of all because they were overheating there and the drone was commanded to go around and attempt a landing in a moment here we're going to hear that the engines are switched to air breathing mode. However, every attempt was made not to use the engines and in fact uh, throughout the descent uh, the engines were not actually throttled up and uh, that proved to be a complicated decision for the EDB because the drone subsequently made a very sharp descent in order to maintain its velocity and so it actually turned around towards the KSC uh, very soon after passing by uh, to the south and in order to maintain velocity as it was programmed to do uh, it made this sort of descent. Do not try this at home kids. But yes, uh, with this descent it was highly unlikely that the, that the Cutlass would be able to stop within the confines of the runway of course. Approaching like this of course it's best to simply apply the brakes right away uh, but clearly air brakes, drag chutes, any of those things. Now the fuel margins are quite tight and so that's an issue to be taken into account. The drone's control system not particularly good and clearly far far to the right on this one. Um, trying to correct here, can it manage it? A uh, bit of a rough landing there and uh, certainly uh, it's going to overshoot the runway here. Spoilers, air brakes, drag chutes, anything, anything would have probably made this look a lot better than it ended up looking. However, it's important to note that the Cutlass did survive. Uh, the Cutlass is intact after its mission, uh, bringing back a heavy payload of liquid fuel. Uh, probably without that payload, even harder to bring down uh, within the confines of the runway. The nerfed space tug was of course launched full of fuel, hence the wobbling, and in retrospect with all the wobbling perhaps it should have been launched without the fuel, 
but it was decided by the EDB that uh, they wanted to make sure that it was fully operational even if the Cutlass should fail to make orbit for instance uh, so yes uh, that is why they launched it fully fueled and why the Cutlass couldn't uh, refuel it in this case in any case it looks like the system works and we'll look forward to watching the nerfed space tug and its refueler cutlass uh, being used to deploy payloads throughout interplanetary space. And so with that, I'll say thank you for watching this presentation of Sandbox CDB. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.